we are looking at LC oscillators and I showed two models which are used to analyze LC oscillators. One is a linear model, does not correspond to any real oscillator, but still it gives you the nature of noise. Okay. <coughs> The other one is closer to reality. And we have a transconductor used to realize a negative resistance. Okay. I versus V of the transconductor goes like that and it has some current limiting <coughs> and you can calculate the phase noise with either of these models and the conclusions are the same that the spectrum of the phase will be of the form a by f square and the phase noise is exactly the same thing. but just for f more than 0. So, if you plot it versus uh, frequency it will do something like that. Okay. That is what L of f is going to be okay. and just as in uh, ring oscillators you can also calculate and show that the sigma square of the jitter it grows linearly with time. Okay. That is you start uh, an ideal oscillator and a real oscillator with synchronized first edge, then the variance of the edge separation grows with time. Okay. So, the main difference between ring oscillator and LC oscillator is the achievable value of A. Okay. A will be in general smaller here and we have an additional degree of freedom the quality of factor if you are able to realize a resonator with a higher quality of factor. When I say a resonator the resonator that you have to compensate using the negative resistance. Okay, It includes all the losses, but uh, it does not include the negative resistance. The quality factor of that <coughs> is what determines the phase noise. So, again just like for uh, the ring oscillator we can make some fundamental calculations. Here we assume that the noise of this is represented by a current source 4 k d times g p. This is always true for any passive circuit whatever equivalent parallel resistance you have the noise of that will be. 4 k d times g p a current source like that and we assume that the noise of g n will be 4 k d g n times gamma I mean depending on how you realize it there could be an excess noise factor gamma. Okay. So, with that assumption or the same thing can be done here. So, the noise of this is 4 k d g p and the noise of that is 4 k t g p times gamma. Okay. So, with that assumption <coughs> the key results are like this. First of all you can see by the way I have uh, in this case instead of L of f I have said delta f this is the offset frequency. So, it is the frequency of fluctuation of phase right and you see like 1 over of delta f square behavior okay. and when you uh, express it like this you also see f naught square in the numerator f naught is the oscillation frequency. 
Okay. So, this part is similar to the ring oscillator right in the ring oscillator it was exactly the same and then we have proportionality to k t just like before times r p which is the loss resistance of the tank Okay. And you get this 1 plus gamma the noise from the positive resistance the loss resistance and noise from the negative resistance ok. V p square the larger the amplitude uh, the lower the phase noise ok. And most importantly you have q square in the denominator there was no equivalent term in the ring oscillator case right. Uh, this one q square uh, comes about because the quality of the quality factor of the tank the higher the it is the more oscillatory the circuit is by itself. If q is infinity you do not need to compensate anything there is no noise at all right and you can now see that the power dissipated in if the oscillation amplitude across this is V p the power dissipated in this part in the tank is V p square by 2 R p right. So, basically this thing can be uh, taken out as power dissipation right. So, we will get k t by 2 1 plus gamma q square times the power dissipation times f naught by delta f square ok. And what did we have for the ring oscillator? What was the expression? <coughs> for the MOS ring oscillator, what was it? minus V t times I p f naught square by delta f square ok. So, So, I p times V t d is the current I sorry it is the power right I p times V t d is the power. So, I will put V t d on top here ok. Now, there are some differences in detail, but ok this half and 8 by 3 there is some other factor, but you have k t of course, and you have 1 plus gamma here. In fact, if this gamma is 1 this half goes away, but you see the inverse proportionality to p d in both places. Then there is some other detail here v d d by v g s minus v t and you have f naught square by delta f square. So, the behavior is the same, the key differentiating factor is this q square ok. So, if you start with an LC circuit which has a high q then you will have better phase noise. The phase noise of an LC oscillator can be much better than the phase noise of a ring oscillator and how much better it is entirely depends on the quality factor. So, you have to somehow minimize all the losses that are there in an LC oscillator ok. 
and if you calculate the figure of merit you will get this. So, the figure of merit we know it goes by this expression right it is inversely related to inversely proportional to L and P D the power dissipation and times F naught square by F square. This is the F of the L C oscillator and F M of the ring oscillator what was it? What was the expression for the F M of the ring oscillator figure of merit of the ring oscillator 3 by 8 uh -huh. <coughs> yeah the 10 power minus 3 is simply because by definition this power dissipation is in milliwatts ok. So, again you see that q square multiplies this. Now, one thing is in case of the ring oscillator we took the power that is drawn from the supply. In case of LC oscillator we have taken just the power dissipated in the tank ok. There will be inefficiencies the power drawn from the supply will be more than the power dissipated in the tank depending on the construction of the negative resistance like class A, class A B and so on. So, if I um, refine this a little further, here what I have done is uh, So, this is the power dissipated in the tank we assume that this is the entire power, but in reality the power drawn from the supply is this divided by the efficiency. The efficiency is 100 percent then the power drawn from the supply is the same as the power dissipated in the tank otherwise power drawn from the supply is this times eta which is the efficiency ok. And I have also added instead of just 1 plus gamma I have a plus beta that is uh, we have noise from the positive resistance and the negative resistance ok which we assume from the positive resistance it is just 4 k d times g p and from the negative resistance it is 4 k d times g n times gamma both are just proportional to the uh, resistances. But in addition while making the negative resistance you have this bias current sources and other circuits right they also have noise ok. So, that extra noise I have shown as beta. Okay, that's what I say here. Is this extra noise from bias, or it could be due to flicker noise and so on? So, whatever extra noise you have, I just add it as one more uh, term, beta. That is, it's as though you have this this is a negative resistance and the noise from m 1 and m 2 can be modeled as 4 k t times g n times gamma ok. The negative resistance of this negative conductance is g m 1 which is I assume g m 1 and g m 2 are the same. So, it is g m 1 divided by 2 right that is the negative resistance seen between these two terminals ok and this gamma will be uh, just two thirds if it is a MOS transistor right. But this uh, current source M 0 will also add some noise ok. So, the way I show that is I will say that it is uh, 4 k d times g n times gamma plus beta ok. The noise of this has nothing to do with the value of g n, but I take whatever noise comes from here and then show it as an additional term over there. So, the negative resistance is supposed to give you some noise, but it gives you some extra noise because of the auxiliary circuits that is what is absorbed into this beta. So, if you look at this 
this f of m is slightly worse than earlier. First of all, it is multiplied by eta, which is always less than 1, it is the efficiency, and then in the denominator, you have an extra term beta, which is always positive, which will also reduce the uh, figure of merit. But still, this is uh, much better than a ring oscillator. Okay. So, let us go back to the simpler expression. Please calculate this uh, f of m in uh, dB. This is always you take 10 log of this for u equals 10. And assume gamma equals one. Okay. So, this is 194 dB, which is way better than I think in the other case we got 164 by dB, right? This is a thousand times better. Okay. Even if you do not get 194, it is still like way better than the ring oscillator. So, these two have sort of two different purposes. If you want very low noise, you, you have to use LC oscillators, but you have to pay the price of large area and limited tunability and so on. Okay. 184. Is it 184? Somehow looks. What is it? I think it is 194. It is 194. It is 2 divided by 4 times 10 to the minus 21. Q square is 100 divided by 2. 10 to the minus 3. So, it is 1 fourth of 10 to the minus sorry 10 to the plus 19. Is it? It is 184. Sorry. Huh? Which one? Yeah, yeah. So, it is 10 to the minus 1. So, this is 10 to the 20. So, it is 200 minus 6. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so, LC oscillators have much better phase noise than ring oscillators. That is the bottom line. Now, the usefulness of this figure of merit calculations, it is not as though you make it make a ring oscillator and it is a uh, figure of merit will be exactly this or if you make any oscillator it will be this it is going to be lower than this, but you should see how much lower it is and then at least we start try to find the reasons for it. Okay, Because if it is way lower than this let us say you make an LC oscillator and your uh, inductors have Q of 10 or 15 and then you have let us say a figure of merit of 180 dB. So, that means there is lot of excess noise. Now, it could be that the way you have designed the circuit, it is inevitable, but at least you have to examine that and then see where all that stuff is coming from and if possible, minimize that. Okay. Any questions about uh, oscillators and phase noise? So, now uh, these oscillators if you make them, they will oscillate at some frequency which is quite uncertain and then they have a lot of variation with uh, process in case of ring oscillator with voltage also and then uh, with temperature. 
ok. So, you certainly cannot use open loop oscillators anywhere because their frequency is quite inaccurate. Now, it turns out there is a particular type of uh, resonator which is a quartz crystal. Now, you end up making a resonator by having a plate of uh, quartz and then uh, painting metallic uh, plates on the two sides. It is just like making a capacitor using a quartz dielectric <coughs> and it is also a piezoelectric material which means that if you apply an electric field it will undergo some mechanical uh, stress right. So, this whole thing uh, behaves like a resonator that is a combination of series L C with some parallel C right and you can make an oscillator with this. Now, I would not go into the details. So, the quartz crystal oscillator looks just like this. So, you have a plate of quartz with a metallic plate on either side and the electrical equivalent of this, there is some electromechanical action going on, but the electrical equivalent is something like this. This is the main uh, this is the branch that denotes the resonance of quartz and then because it is like a capacitor there will always be some capacitance between the between this terminal and that. This is terminal 1, terminal 2 that is the equal. Now, there are two things one is that uh, the q turns out to be very high ok. So, you make an oscillator with this, it is like an L C oscillator with a very high q for the L C tank. So, the phase noise will be very low because you know that it is inversely proportional to q square ok. On top of that this uh, quartz also has another nice property that it has a very low <coughs> temperature coefficient. Now, the actual frequency at which this resonates depends on the dimensions of the quartz crystal, but once you have machined it and trimmed it to some value what happens is as you change temperature the frequency changes by very little because as this is some material property of quartz it has very low temperature coefficient ok. So, that is why the preferred way of uh, having a very accurate frequency is to make a quartz crystal oscillator ok. Now, but it turns out that this uh, quartz crystal oscillators you can make them for uh, frequencies oscillation frequencies of 100 megahertz or less like usually a few tens of megahertz are common 20 megahertz 40 megahertz etcetera ok. So, this is uh, now we have some uh, because of material property of quartz we have some oscillator whose frequency is very accurate whose phase noise is very low whose frequency does not change with temperature, but of course, it oscillates at a relatively low frequency not at the data rate of the serial links that we are interested in ok and also the frequency of this is not variable. So, from this we need to be able to generate let us say 10 gigabits per second. Uh, so, that it is also accurately defined it should track the frequency of this ok and also we want it to be variable. So, we want a variable frequency, but that variable frequency should track the frequency of the crystal oscillator that is it should not vary much with temperature and so on ok. So, essentially what we need is we need a frequency multiplier. So, we have to take whatever frequency the quartz crystal oscillates at and multiply it by some n. So, that we get n times f crystal 
and we can make n variable ok that is the idea is this fine. So, a block that does that for us is what is known as the phase lock loop. Essentially, what we do is we compare the phase of the reference with the phase of uh, some output frequency, right, and then make the corrections to the frequency. Now, this is not totally unfamiliar to us because we have already done CDRs, that is exactly what we do, right, clock and data recovery circuits. We compare the phase of the clock with the phase of the VCO and then apply corrections to the VCO. In the end, in steady state, what happens is the uh, VCO will be VCO will have the same frequency as the incoming data and also will be in phase alignment with the incoming data. Okay. So, normally I would have a more elaborate introduction to the phase lock loop, but since you already know this, we can go to that straight away. Okay. The only thing is this is in fact a little bit simpler than the uh, clock and data recovery circuit. The clock and data recovery circuit operates with random data inputs, whereas this has a periodic reference. All we have to do is take the periodic reference and multiply it up. Is this okay? So, the CDR without the forward eight clock, right. We had D in, we had some kind of phase detector, and from this we had the charge pump and the loop filter. This is the recovered clock. Okay. Now, essentially this compares the phase of uh, clock with the phase of the data and we saw what kind of phase detectors work for random data right that is essentially this phase detector gives you an output only when d in has an edge ok. Now, what we want is something similar that is we have I will show it like this. This whole thing means a crystal oscillator ok. In fact, here onwards I will not even show that and this gives you some uh, reference frequency that is the standard terminology for it. So, maybe let us say it is 20 megahertz it will be. So, in a crystal oscillator if it is 20 megahertz you can assume it is 20 megahertz ok. The drift from 20 megahertz will be maybe in the hundreds of uh, parts per million ok. We are talking about 0 0.01 percent or less. So, now we uh, take this and we will have our VCO which is oscillating at uh, some frequency let us say 10 gigahertz and somehow we have to adjust the control voltage. So, that this is not just approximately 10 gigahertz, but this is exactly 10 gigahertz that is you want 20 megahertz times 500 ok. So, if you do that you will get 10 gigahertz right. So, it should be exactly 10 gigahertz that is what you want. So, you somehow have to adjust the control voltage there is no way of doing this open loop you cannot set the V control to let us say 13.5 millivolts and then expect that the output will be like this because that will drift that will go all over the place ok. So, we have to do this with feedback anything that is accurate you have to use feedback you have to sense the actual output compare it with the input and then apply corrections. So, in some sense these two are similar although the goals are different as I will explain. So, first of all we will use the same thing we will use a phase detector between the reference and some signal, but of course, here the data was at some frequency and clock is eventually at the same frequency same frequency meaning the data rate and the clock frequency are the same. Okay. 
whereas of course here this is at some much higher frequency. So what we do is we divide the frequency by some n. In this case, in this example, n is 500. So, if this, uh, if the VCO's output frequency happens to be exactly 10 gigahertz, what is the output of the frequency divider? It is 20 megahertz. Okay. So, we compare the phase of these two. Now, what happens is, if this is slightly different from 10 gigahertz, this will be slightly different from 20, and the phase difference between them will grow with time, right? And that's what the phase detector uses to correct for the phase. And again, like I said, I won't give an elaborate introduction since you already know the what works. So I'll use exactly the same circuit here. There is a charge pump, <coughs> and there is a loop filter. Okay. We'll see what kind of uh, uh, what kind of phase detector is suitable here because here we have random data and a periodic clock. Here we have both signals to be periodic. Okay. Now, while uh, superficially they are similar, there are still some differences. The main uh, aim of the CDR is to track D in and recover its value that is you want to find out what the input data is that is why we have a clock and data recovery circuit right. So, if your data moves the clock should move with that and then find out the value of D whereas, <coughs> the phase lock loop is a generic term actually even this could be called a phase lock loop because it is after all locking some two phases. <coughs> But this is the classical phase lock loop. Here, the goal is to generate a periodic signal. Okay, meaning I am not tracking anything here, right? There is no data that I want to recover and so on. All I want is that the output should be at 10 gigahertz and exactly at 10 gigahertz that is I want its spectrum to be as much like an impulse as possible or in the time domain I want every cycle of that to be equal to each other and equal to 100 picoseconds. Okay. So, the two goals are slightly different in this actually we do allow for disturbances in C k right because if D in is varying uh, the D in has jitter C k should actually follow that so that it tracks it properly whereas here we do not want to do that. Okay. Ideally even if the reference frequency reference has some jitter they should not follow that. Okay, So, that is one thing and then any other disturbances like for instance we will have noise from uh, this resistance and other things right. <coughs> you also know that in this case even if D in has no jitter right uh, because of some periodic disturbances here you could have some junk right. So, here also you will have that and that problem is a lot worse because here the input uh, data is at the same frequency as the output whereas here it is at a lower frequency. So, if you have periodic disturbances I will explain these things in detail you have periodic disturbances at reference frequency that will modulate the VCO. So, all these things we have to minimize all the systematic uh, uh, disturbances to periodicity of the output and any random disturbances that is noise we have to minimize. Okay. So, for that we will actually modify the structure slightly right and then uh, we will derive the classical phase lock loop. Is this okay? Now, because we are familiar with the clock and data recovery circuit I put down this picture right away. <coughs> Only difference is that in a CDR the input data and the output clock are at the same frequency. So, we do a direct phase comparison whereas, uh, in case of the phase lock loop the whole idea is frequency multiplication. So, we divide the output frequency by an appropriate number and we compare the phase of the reference and the divided output clock okay. and the rest of it is the same. So, you have a phase detector which will drive a charge pump and the charge pump will either increase or decrease the control voltage depending on if the phase difference is increasing or decreasing between these two. So, eventually the, 
these two signals right the two signals being compared they should have the same frequency and phase otherwise this will keep giving some output ok and uh, so, this will eventually have the same frequency and phase which means that the output of the VCO will have n times the reference frequency ok. This will be n times f ref in steady state. Here. Yeah, it does actually because uh, the omega u loop is the corner of j tall, right? So, there will be some requirement. In fact, like I said, there are conflicting requirements, especially if you want to use this clock elsewhere, you also want to limit the jitter. So, you want to follow the input jitter from the point of view of recovering the data. But let us say you also want to use this clock elsewhere. So, then the, if the input data is very jittery, this clock also will be very jittery. You may not want that. So, you have to choose that uh, in the bandwidth basically the corner of j tall, which is the same as corner of jitter transfer, right? Uh, appropriately, that is, uh, you may not want to generate too much jitter either. I mean, you may not want to transfer too much jitter either. So, what happens is uh, firstly ok, first you said the settling time is related to uh, I mean is inversely proportional to omega loop. <coughs> yeah, no I mean the statement I wanted to make is something else. This is uh, this has a 0 right, it has a pole 0 doublet. So, the settling time could be dominated by the frequency of the 0 ok, because you have two poles in that uh, whole system. So, that will give a slow settling component, but anyway that is a small detail. See what happens is first let us assume that it is in uh, steady state. If you want you can imagine d n is alternating data, so that it is periodic. So, this will go and lock to the middle of the data ok. Then you have a uh, consecutive identical digits, so there are no transitions. There are no transitions basically this uh, these two current sources are both off and V control should not change at all. So, that means that the output should be oscillating in exactly the same way ok that is it should preserve its phase ideally right is not it. Because now you have a weak control which has been established and then after that ideally it is not changing because there is no path for the discharge of this voltage ok. No that will not that is not oh no then it will not work at all. So, if then there are no transitions both up and down are 0 that is how the phase detector works right. So, uh, essentially we have. So, in steady state the this capacitor gets charged to the voltage that brings the VCO to the right frequency ok. So, we have the C and R and the VCO. So, they should continue to oscillate at that frequency and the phase of the VCO is continuous. So, whatever previously established phase was there it will keep oscillating with the same phase. So, ideally these oscillations even if uh, let us say you have alternating data and after that you have this right. The output of this it would have been locked like this and it should remain that way ok. Now, of course, it is not as though you can tolerate an infinite number of uh, identical digits. First of all, if the temperature drifts the characteristic of the VCO will change, but that is even slower. Now, what happens is it is not exactly true that this voltage will remain exactly constant. There will be leakages right. There will be I mean you have reverse bias junctions they will draw some current and sometimes even uh, yeah. So, those things will there will be leakage paths always. So, the voltage will drift ok. So, that is one thing and then you know that this voltage itself will have some ripple in the bang bang operation ok. So, exactly where it settles is not <coughs> the precise voltage which gives you the right frequency ok, because it could be slightly higher or lower depending on what happened before. So, this could be at a slightly different frequency 
okay that does not matter for a few digits, but uh, beyond a certain value the phase would have drifted off too much ok. No, no when there is no uh, when there are no data transitions <coughs> there is no tracking in that there is no information about the phase, but the VCO will retain its phase and frequency such that it will be sampling in the middle of the nominal symbol duration right. So, the next time there is a transition. So, next time it does that. So, this should still be So, next time there is a transition right this will still be tracking the middle of that. No, data recovery the data comes from here right the data output inside the phase detector I mean the way I have drawn it I have not shown the output data. The data actually comes from one of the flip flops within the phase detector and one of the flip flops in the phase detector will simply have the D input as D in and clock input as clock. So, the output of that is the recovered data yeah this is the this is just the recovered clock ok. The, the recovered data comes from yeah. So, this D 1 could be the recovered data or D 2 I mean this uh, this one right. So, but uh, the assumption that, that is actually very important to minimize leakage from this node ok, because if you have a lot of leakage there actually if the, the one of the problems is that I think you have calculated this capacitor value can be quite large. Now, if you try to realize the large capacitor you have you will use up a lot of area you could try to use let us say MOS capacitor uh, which uh, is very dense on the other hand it will also have leakage. So, you cannot really use a MOS capacitor here if you do use that then it because of its leakage this voltage will keep on drifting. So, then what will happen is that the frequency will change once the frequency changes it is uh, eventually the phase will just drift off to some value ok. So, that is why there is a limit on the number of uh, uh, consecutive identical digits basically a duration in which you do not have any transitions right because you have to preserve the VCO phase and frequency over that time otherwise you have a problem. But the initial settling of course, that takes time that is uh, you start applying the data uh, <coughs> even if the VCO starts with the right frequency for it to come to the right phase it will take time and that is related to the settling time of the loop ok. <coughs> Any questions? So, here uh, we want to try and generate a periodic signal. Uh, so, that is why uh, we will have some other constraints which will give us some slight modifications ok. Now, this phase detector it is operating with two periodic inputs. So, it can be in fact simpler than the other one I will show what that circuit is. And this loop filter will need some enhancement so that the output does not have any disturbances from periodicity. This is okay. Otherwise, I mean it is largely similar to the CDR, the small signal model will also be similar to the CDR. The way you choose the parameters may be different, okay. And of course, the CDR does not have a divider in the feedback loop, this one does have a divider. Any questions? It is needed in the transmitter as well as the receiver. The it is needed in the receiver because uh, this VCO right. So, first of all there are different architectures. So, we said that one of the architectures is in the receiver you generate a periodic signal with a fixed frequency and then put it through a multi phase generator a phase interpolator especially when you use a digital clock and data recovery. So, you need a PLL for the receiver. But even if you use this type of analog structure for the receiver, it turns out I mean if you just throw in the VCO into this loop starting from some arbitrary state, it will not lock at all ok. So, typically what happens is an analog CDR loop will first be configured as a phase lock loop. So, that this VCO frequency comes close to the desired frequency right, but it is operating from the crystal on the receiver side. So, the frequency is not exactly the same because the transmit frequency is related to the crystal on the transmitter side 
whereas this is now related to the crystal on the receiver side. The two will be apart by few hundred parts per million. So, you have both loops, the same ECU being controlled by the two loops and you what you do is essentially you would have shorted these. Okay. So, in the initial part this charge pump will be active, there are other things also if you use an LC VCO you have to have that uh, those uh, we have the coarse tuning right that has to be brought to the right setting. Okay. After that you enable the PLL, so that it comes to the right frequency. So, initially this charge pump these switches will be enabled and this will be disabled. Okay. So, the VCO comes to the right control voltage, then you disable this uh, charge pump and enable that one. Okay. Then it will start operating from the phase difference between this clock and data. It has been it has already been brought to the almost the right frequency. So, then this loop can take over and then do that job. Okay. So, you do need a PLL for the receiver also. This is okay. Although, I mean in principle we say that the loop corrects for uh, frequency and phase disturbances. If you start with uh, frequencies which are very different, nothing will happen, it will just sit there doing nothing. Is it okay? Fine. So, we will continue our discussion with the PLL and then see what has to be done to minimize any disturbances to the periodicity of the loop.